save. All right, hello everyone. Uh, this is the second episode of the Libertarian Communist Cast, as well as the second um, entry in the uh, series that this podcast is doing. Um, doing a critical reading of Noam Chomsky's collection of essays on anarchism. Last episode, we did Nathan Schneider's introduction to the collection of essays. And now we'll, we will be addressing the first essay in the collection, um, Notes on Anarchism by Chomsky. And, uh, so yeah, do you, do you have any uh, preliminary preliminary thoughts, uh, Ben? Um, I don't really have too much to add right now. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, I was not able to, uh, I suppose, get as much time with the first chapter as I wanted. So as really? like a heads up, I guess I'm like I don't have too many profound things to say about this particular chapter. Um, right. But I mean. For anyone who was uh, a narco curious enough to join us <laughs> for this uh, second iteration, uh, yeah. we're glad to have you. This one, I mean, yeah, this this is going to be a bit more interesting still, though, because I mean, this is like, I mean, like you said, the actual book, and this is where he starts to like kind of present his like definitions on what he considers to be anarchism. And, you know, we get Chomsky's actual opinions on yeah uh, what he's going to talk about. So yeah, I mean, we're gonna let Piper handle the uh, summary this time. Yeah. Also, um, try not to be too distracted by Ben's profile picture. <laughs> this uh, is my. This is my. This is like my uh, my my shame corner, my self struggle session for. Uh, yeah, your not not reading the first chapter as much as I should have. Your self criticism, yeah. <laughs> um. Okay. So. Uh, the essay is called Notes on Anarchism. Basically, this is just Chomsky giving some summary analysis of the main tenets of anarchism as a political tradition and as a doctrine, if you want to call it that, although calling anything a doctrine is kind of has certain connotations that are negative, but in any, in any case. Um, so uh, Chomsky basically uh, starts out with insisting that anarchism is a form of, of socialism, particularly libertarian socialism. As far as I know, um, libertarian socialism is a term that was first used by Rudolf Rocker. He uses it in his um, work, Anarcho-Syndicalism Theory and Practice. Rudolf Rocker was one of the main thinkers of the anarcho-syndicalist movement. Um, and so Chomsky starts out defining anarchism this way. And really, the rest of his arguments are essentially calibrated towards substantiating that definition of anarchism. Um, so uh, Chomsky supplies quotes by Rudolf Rocker, um, where Rudolf Rocker is talking about essentially uh, why anarchists are libertarian socialists. One of the quotes he supplies is uh, this one. Anarcho-syndicalists are convinced that a socialist economic order cannot be created by the decrees and statutes of a government, but only by the solidaric collaboration of the workers with hand and brain in each special branch of production. That is, through the taking over of the management of all plants by the producers themselves under such form that the separate groups, plants, and branches of industry are independent members of the general economic organism and syst systemically carry out or carry on production and the distribution of the products in the interest of the community on the basis of 
free mutual agreements. And so introducing that quote, Chomsky says, as a socialist, Rocker would take for granted that the serious, final, complete liberation of the workers is possible only upon one condition, that of the appropriation of capital, that is of raw material and all the tools of labor, including land by the whole body of the workers. Um, so, yeah. And then uh, Chomsky concludes on that with the remark that Rocker was writing at a moment when such ideas had been put into practice in a dramatic way in the Spanish Revolution. Uh, and he, Chomsky takes a lot of influence from the Spanish Revolution. He's said in multiple interviews that he was, was writing about the Spanish Revolution from an early age. Um, so, yeah, then he goes on... Uh, to talk about the conception of the state and taking state power in uh, the tra the respective traditions of Marxism and anarchism. Uh, he quotes uh, Ingalls and Bakunin espousing their contradictory uh, theories of the state, where one insists that the state is a kind of elitist um, inequality preserving institution and then the other is asserting that um, to carry out social transformation socialists need to take control of the state um, so yeah um, and then Chomsky himself closes out uh, that um that thought with uh, this remark that he doesn't uh, actually claim, he says he doesn't uh, quote unquote claim uh, to know uh, what the right approach is vis-a-vis uh, -vis taking state power or, destro or destroying the state, uh, which as someone who identifies with anarchism yeah. and someone who uh, is writing about anarchism, I would have thought he would have had a solid position on that, but you know, I guess he, he's agnostic toward it, which is very strange. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Because, like, even in the intro, like, even in the introduction, which, I mean, you know, this just doesn't make the introduction look any better. It was explicitly claimed, you know, it's like Chomsky is an anarchist. Chomsky's anarchism. Yeah, And now we're kind of at a point where Chomsky is unable to even agree upon, like, one of the most basic, you know, aspects of anarchism. Yeah. He says, I do not pretend to know the answer to this question, but it seems clear that unless there is, in some form, a positive answer, the chances for a truly democratic revolution that will achieve the humanistic ideals of the left are not great. Uh, so I, you know, he, so he says this is an important question, but he says that he doesn't know the answer to it, which is, I don't know, that just comes off as very strange to me. Um, uh, you know, because this is, I mean, this is a pre strategic question, or this is a, this is a str strategic question, not a tactical question. So, um, so the question of whether you take state power comes from the analysis that you do of the state and its role in the modern world. Uh, and so, you know, once you do, all you need to do is have that analysis and then you can extrapolate to the strategic implications of taking state power or destroying the state. So I'm not sure why he remains agnostic about this question. Uh, but in any case, um, and then so, you know, he um, goes on about how the Bolsheviks uh, in their seizing of state power um, vilified, or vilified is not the right word, validated uh, Bakunin's uh, prediction that uh, state socialism would simply produce a red bureaucracy. 
Uh, so he says, despite Bakunin's warnings about the red bureaucracy and their fulfillment under Stalin's dictatorship, it would obviously be a gross error in interpreting the debates of a century ago to rely on the claims of contemporary social movements as to their historical origins. In particular, it is perverse to regard Bolshevism as Marxism in practice. Either the left-wing critique of Bolshevism taking account of the historical circumstances of the Russian Revolution is far more to the point. Um, and then, you know, he uh, provides uh, a quote uh, that basically um, uh, states and asserts that the Bolsheviks um, had, you know, were just, were this kind of petty bourgeois force that took power for themselves instead of um, uh, helping to make conditions ripe for uh, the uh, proletariat as a whole to take power. Um, and uh, then he says, if one were to seek a single leading idea within the anarchist tradition, it should, I believe, be that, excuse me, be that expressed by Bakunin when writing on the Paris Commune, he, did, he identifies his, himself as follows. Uh, and so, and this is then Bakunin uh, uh, explaining his conception of liberty, that liberty is uh, uh, the uh, real um, ability of self-actualization for individuals. Uh, and so kind of just this conception of liberty as a right that the state grants you is hollow and meaningless. And so interestingly, in the quote uh, that Chomsky provides, um, Bakunin actually critiques Rousseau's liberal conception of liberty um, and mentions Rousseau, Rousseau by name. He says, not the individualistic, egoistic, shabby, and fictitious liberty extolled by the school of J.J. Rousseau and the other schools of bourgeois liberalism, which considers the would-be rights of all men represented by the state, which limits the rights of each, an idea that leads inevitably to the reduction of the rights of each to zero. But then, literally right after, Chomsky says, These ideas grow out of the Enlightenment. Their roots are in Rousseau's discourse on inequality, Humboldt's limits of state action, Kant's insistent, insistence in his defense of the French Revolution that freedom is the precondition for acquiring the maturity uh, for freedom, not a gift to be granted when such maturity is achieved. So... This is something that Chomsky often does. He tries to correlate anarchist conceptions of liberty with those of classical liberalism. And we can already kind of see why that is something that he shouldn't be doing when he quotes Bakunin saying, no, you know, the conception of liberty extolled by the liberals uh, is hollow and meaningless. And then... Chomsky ignores that, ignores Bakunin's own words, and goes on to assert that, you know, uh, Bakunin's conception of liberty comes from the liberal uh, conception. So that's uh, that's pretty, uh, you know, that's that's a pretty massive inconsistency on Chomsky's part. Um, and so then Chomsky goes on to arguing that. Capitalism uh, as a system of production is contradictory uh, to uh, meaningful conceptions of liberty to humans uh, that live under capitalism really being free. That, you know, uh, the essentially arguing that the subjects of wage labor uh, are not free. Uh, because wage labor is uh, a mechanism that ensures their lack of freedom. Um, and so 
Uh, he says, with the development of industrial capitalism, a new and unanticipated system of injustice, it is libertarian socialism that has pres preserved and extended the radical humanist message of the Enlightenment and classical liberal ideas that were perverted into an ideology to sustain the emerging social order. Now, uh, this was particularly interesting for me because here Chomsky is asserting that um, that uh, you know the liberal ideology wasn't uh, enmeshed in uh, capitalism. It wasn't um, an ideology of capitalism uh, until later when capitalism corrupts it. And that's just not true from the point of view of the history. So the actual history is that after the French Revolution, as Chomsky refers to here, um, there is a debate between conservatives and liberals. Now, uh, some people may be under the impression that the, uh, that, uh, the French Revolution, uh, you know, uh, created capitalism in France. It led to the development of capitalism. It paved the way for capitalism. Um, and that's, that's not true. Capitalism had been present in Europe, uh, for hundreds of years before the French revolution. Um, so, you know, so what the French revolution does is pave the way for this debate between liberals and conservatives. And this is a debate about, uh, how, uh, capitalism should uh, maintain its stability. This is a question of how best uh, to preserve capitalism. Uh, and so when the liberals are talking about liberty and, um, you know, the limiting of the state and political rights and do it, you know, and, uh, you know, some of them doing this on the basis of the French Revolution, maybe. Um, they're talking about uh, their program of administering limited concessions to those at the bottom of capitalism's social ladder in order uh, to prevent, you know, uh, upheaval by those at the bottom of the social ladder, in order to prevent revolutionary... <laughs> Uh, instability for capitalism. So, uh, you know, essentially Chomsky's view of liberalism as something that was, uh, you know, uh, as something that was corrupted by capitalism uh, is not historically ac accurate. It's a rosy view. Um, is Ben still here? Ben, are you there? Yeah, I'm still here. Oh, okay. Do you have any thoughts so far? Uh, no, I'm mostly going to save a lot of it for the conclusion. <clears throat> gotcha. Uh, sounds good. Um, okay. Uh, but so then he goes on to talk about how uh, capitalism um, uh, prevents human liberty. He quotes uh, Marx's uh, early work talking about how um, the uh, industrial processes of capitalism alienate the laborer from any control over his activity or their activity, I should say. Um, he says, it is true that, cla that classical libertarian thought is opposed to state intervention in social life as a consequence of deeper assumptions about the human need for liberty diversity and free associate and free association on the same assumptions capitalist relations of production wage labor competitiveness the ideology of possessive individualism quote unquote all must be regarded as fundamentally anti-human libertarian socialism is properly to be regarded as the inheritor of the liberal ideas of the enlightenment um and so then he kind of draws on rudolf rocker and quotes him uh, saying that uh, Rudolf Rocker describes modern anarchism as, 
quote, the confluence of the two great currents which during and since the French Revolution have found such characteristic expression in the intellectual life of Europe, socialism, and liberalism. Uh, and then he says the classical liberal ideals, uh, he, being Rocker, ar argues were wrecked on the realities of capitalist economic forms. So here he's kind of grafting his view that liberalism was a uh, project of political liberty, uh, you know, before capitalism becomes dominant and then capitalism corrupts it as a kind of ideological justification of uh, lack of liberty through this illusory claim of liberty. Um, uh, and he, he grafts that on to Rudolf Rocker. Um, now, Rudolf Rocker um, does talk about liberalism. He was inspired by liberalism to some extent. He wrote a book about liberal political thought. Uh, but the thing about Rocker and his conception of liberalism is that um, he doesn't have this conception that Chomsky does. Uh, Rocker has a more uh, you know, reality-based view of liberalism, which is that, um, that liberalism's uh, ideas of liberty, no matter how valuable in some sense they may have been were directly limited by the realities of capitalism uh the state private property um and so you know and this and he says this in anarcho-syndicalism theory and practice um so you know here chomsky is kind of reading his rosy view of liberalism into uh the classical anarchists like rocker even when, as before, we saw Bakunin directly objecting to that view uh, in a quote that Chomsky himself provided. Uh, and so I'll talk about in the end, uh, you know, why I think this is really problematic. Um, but, okay, so then uh, Chomsky draws on Daniel Guerin uh, talking about... Um, how Guerin, uh, you know, and uh, Bakunin lay the basis for uh, the socialist aspect of libertarian socialism. Chomsky says a consistent anarchist must oppose private ownership of the means of production and the wage slavery, which is a component of this system, as incompatible with the principle that labor must be freely undertaken and under the control of the producer. As Marx put it, socialists look forward to a society in which labor will, quote, become not only a means of life, but also the highest want in life, unquote. Um, and so then he kind of talks about how, um, using Marx as a basis, how uh, capitalism and its industrial processes uh, subordinate the laborer and make the laborer unfree. Um, Chomsky then says, anarcho-syndicalists sought, even under capitalism, to create free associations of free producers that would engage in militant struggle and prepare to take over the organization of production on a democratic, on a democratic basis. These associations would serve as a practical school of anarchism. If private ownership of the means of production is, in Proudhon's often coined phrase, merely a form of theft, the exploitation of the weak by the strong control of production by a state bureaucracy, no matter how benevolent its intentions also does not create the conditions under which labor manual and intellectual can become the highest want in life. Both then both then must be overcome. And so basically he goes into a critique of the of state socialism, the idea that the, that the state can implement uh, social change that emancipates the working class. Um, duh, 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 duh. and so he talks about the Paris Commune a little bit and how it how it uh, aimed to threaten the cap the the capitalist uh, property norms 
that uh, you know capitalist ideologues considered inherent to civilization. Uh, he says, despite the violent destruction of the commune, Bakudin wrote that Paris opens a new era, that of the definitive and complete emancipation of the popular masses and their future true solidarity across and despite state boundaries. The next revolution of man, international and solidarity, will be the resurrection of Paris, a revolution that the world still awaits, Chomsky says, after that Bakudin quote. He says the consistent anarchist then should be a socialist, but a socialist of a particular sort. He will not only oppose alienated and specialized labor and look forward to the appropriation of capital by the whole body of workers, but he will also insist that this appropriation be direct, not exercised by some elite force acting in the name of the proletariat. Um, so, yeah, then he quotes Panacook, uh, Anton Panacook. Um, who uh, was a big theorist of uh, council communism. Uh, you know, he quotes Pentecook talking about how socialism uh, can, can't really be realized by state socialism. Socialism essentially needs to get rid of the state and its power. Um, and Chom Chomsky likes, uh, likes council communism a lot. He, Talks about it a lot. He talks about Panacook a lot. Um, so, uh, yeah, then he goes into talking about the Spanish Revolution. He talks about how uh, the, uh, the, uh, the anarchists prepared uh, for uh, a long time going into the revolutionary upheaval of July 1936, which is true, um, you know, uh, leading up to the revolution, this, the uh, CNT was a, a mass union of millions of people. Um, and so he talks a little bit more about that. He says, the ideas of libertarian socialism in this sense described – have been submerged in the industrial societies of the past half century. The dominant ideologies have been those of state socialism or state capitalism of an increasingly militarized character in the United States for reasons that are not obscure. But here has been a rekindling of, uh, but there has, but there has been a rekindling of interest in the past few years. The thesis I quoted by Anton Panikuk were taken from a recent pamphlet of a radical French workers' group, information, information's correspondence over air. The remarks by William Paul on revolutionary socialism are cited in a paper by Walter Kendall, given at the National Conference on Workers' Control in Sheffield, England, in March uh, 1969. The workers' control movement has become a significant force in England in the past few years. It has organized several conferences and has produced a substantial uh, pamphlet literature and counts among its active adherents, representatives of some of the most important trade unions. The Amalgamated Engineering and Foundry Workers Union, for example, has adopted as official policy the program of nationalization of basic industries under workers' control at all levels. On the continent, there are similar developments. May 68, of course, accelerated the growing interest in council communism and related ideas in France and Germany as it did in England. Given the general conservative cast of our highly ideological society, it is not too surprising that the United States has been relatively untouched by these developments, but that, but that too may change. The erosion of the Cold War mythology at least makes it possible to raise these questions in fairly broad circles. If the present wave of repression can be beaten back, if the left can overcome its more suicidal tendencies and build upon what has been accomplished in the past decade, then the problem of how to organize industrial society on, a tr on truly democratic lines with democratic control in the workplace and in the community should become a dominant intellectual issue for those who are alive, um, who are alive to the problems of contemporary society. And as a mass movement for libertarian socialism develops, speculation should proceed to action. And so that's really where... Um, 
where this essay leaves off. So basically, in summary, his argument that anar is that anarchism represents libertarian socialism, a conception of socialism that sees socialism as a society of free producers achieved by the producers themselves who are currently subordinate to capitalist industrial processes. And um, that this conception is basically the most consistent kind of socialism, um, you know, that uh, the state trying to implement uh, social change, trying to transform society in a socialist direction um, doesn't work because it's just more of the same top-down mechanisms that subordinate uh, workers that workers typically encounter in the capitalist mode of production. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's basically uh, the summary. Uh, Chomsky does a lot of uh, does a lot of like really long quotations, not really really long, but he quotes full paragraphs a lot, and that's kind of. I find that kind of <laughs> annoying. I did that a little bit in this summary, but um, I tried to keep that to a minimum. Chomsky doesn't like every page. Um, and I think that's really annoying from a reader's point of view. Uh, but so anyway, but that, yeah, that's the, that's the summary. So uh, if Ben, if you have anything to say to start out uh, discussion of it. I mean, I think like, <clears throat> my biggest problem with the whole essay i mean i suppose like what i'll mostly do is just kind of say what my overall impression was uh from like the brief read through i did um right i mean i pretty much agree with you that like one of my biggest issues with it um starting off on some more of the negatives is like chomsky really does try and still marry like classical liberal thought to like libertarian socialism and anarchism in general i think maybe it just has to do with the fact that as an academic chomsky is mostly concerned with like in some ways finding like a genealogy of like philosophical thought um i think at least personally i think it's more useful to have like a view of anarchism and socialism as you know also movements and struggles that arise from like you know oppressed and exploited classes struggling for their own emancipation and i don't think chomsky wouldn't agree with that but i just think he spends too much time like i'm um, just trying to save uh like uh jj russo humboldt john stuart mills relevance in the conversation you know right and I mean, even on that, like, I would have thought he would have at least brought up some maybe more of, like, the slightly more relevant, like, liberals or, like, I remember Godwin was always kind of, like, on the fence there. I always, I always recall, like, usually when people talk about, like, the history of, like, early anarchist thought, they'll bring up, like, people like him a bit more. Um, what else? Uh, I had a few notes. Let me see. Um, I think the other, well, I'll get into that later. Um, but as for like what I did appreciate about it, I think the, the one good thing at least that like I would say if, if someone were to like read the book and they were like completely like ambivalent towards anarchism or just getting into it, at least through Chomsky's like use of like co like constant quotations, like you said, every other page, there are actually like some sources in here you can get out of it that would actually be quite useful. Like I think you know, if you were interested in anarchism, reading and studying like what Rocker, um, Bakunin, uh, Daniel Gurin is actually he has some good introductions, like anarchism from theory to practices. I don't yeah. know if that was the book he referenced, but that one would be yeah, definitely would. a good thing if people were trying to explore anarchism. Um, yeah. So I think ju just as a byproduct of this effort, that is actually 
something that I could see. I'm like, I got use of back when I was just reading this. And I think a lot of people might be able to, too. Um, Chomsky, at least in this one, is like a little less um, obscure in like how he approaches his definition of anarchism, because like you said, he does at least say that you can encapsulate like the kind of milieu of the time still into like libertarian socialism. So there right. is at least that. Um, aside from that though, there are a few other things I wanted to say, but I think I want to let you continue on if there's anything else you want to get to. Yeah. So, um, so I, yeah, I, I have two major problems with Chomsky's thesis here. Mm -hmm. um, the first is his reading into classical anarchism of classical anarchism being anarchism of the 19th and 20th centuries of uh, really before the second world war um, reading into that, uh, a you know, a, uh, a continuation of liberalism um, and also his description of libertarian socialism as an industrial society that is then controlled by free producers. So um, I, I think his strong point here is the fact that unlike Nathan Schneider, who wants to associate anarchism with uh, right-wing libertarianism, with anonymous, yeah, with, um, Occupy Wall Street, Occupy with uh, cooperative uh, right-wing libertarianism, uh, you know, uh, conservative churches that practice uh, that practice some kind of community support. Um, <laughs> it, basically, everything under the sun that's maybe a little bit communitarian or anti-establishment. Um, Chomsky instead here insists that anarchism, uh, if it is to mean anything, is to describe a political tradition, and that political tradition, which has identified itself as anarchist, has largely been libertarian socialist, and that's you know correct. Um, you know, libertarian socialism being socialism uh, conceived of as a society of free producers uh, achieved by the producers themselves. Okay. So, uh, but so first I want to address uh, this lib, this uh, thing with liberalism. Um, so uh, what I've done is I've uh, gotten a PDF of anarcho syndicalism theory and practice, and I've typed in the word liberal. So we're going to take a look and see what Rocker has to say about liberalism. So uh, to uh, give credence to what Chomsky said, he does say anarcho-syndicalism, Rocker, Rocker does say, anarcho-syndicalism as, pre as presented in this earnest but somewhat heavily written little book is, is on the one hand a restatement of essential liberal doctrine in modern terms, and on the other a reaction against the form which the socialist movement has assumed. Um, so he does say that. Uh, then in the next mention of the word liberalism, liberalism is one of the key words listed as um, listed in the uh, kind of a kind of group of key words for the chapter anarchism, its aims and purposes. So the next mention of liberalism, let's see. Uh, English workers, sections of liber liberal intelligentsia. That's not really. So let's go down a little bit here. I should have I should have done this beforehand, but whatever. Um, in modern, uh, so he says, in modern anarchism, we have the confluence of the two great currents, which during and since the French Revolution have found characteristic expression in the intellectual life of Europe, socialism and liberalism. Uh, he says, modern socialism developed when profound observers of social life came to see more and more clearly that political constitutions 
and changes in the form of government could never get to the bottom of that great problem that we call the social question. Its supporters recognize it as social equalizing of human beings, despite uh, the loveliest theoretical assumptions is not possible so long as people are separated into classes on the basis of their owning or not owning property. Classes whose mere existence excludes and advance any thought of a genuine community. And so there developed the recognition that uh, only by elimination of economic monopolies and common ownership of the means of production, in a word, by a complete transformation of all economic conditions and social institutions associated with them, does a condition of social justice become thinkable, a status in which, a, in which society shall become a genuine community and human labor shall no longer serve the ends of exploitation, but shall serve to assure abundance to everyone. But as soon as socialism began to assemble its forces and become a movement, there at once came to light certain differences of opinion due to the influence of the social environment in different countries. It is a fact that every political concept from theocracy to Caesarism and dictatorship have affected certain factions in the socialist movement. Meanwhile, there have been two great currents in political thought which have been of decisive significance for the development of socialistic ideas. Liberalism, which powerfully stimulated advanced minds in the Anglo-Saxon countries and and Spain in particular, and democracy in the latter sense, to which Rousseau gave expression in his social contract and which found its most influential representatives in the leaders of French Jacobism. While liberalism in its social theorizing started off from the individual in which to limit the, state act, the state's activities to a minimum, democracy took its stand on an abstract collective concept Rousseau's general will, which it thought to fix in the national state. Okay, so he's describing liberalism as a theory of how the national state should be. And the national state is not something that exists until capitalism becomes dominant in the 19th century. Okay, so here we have a contradiction with Chomsky's assertion that Rocker shared his own opinion that liberalism was kind of this idea that was corrupted by capitalism. Okay. So he says liberalism and democracy were preeminently political concepts. And since the great majority of the original adherents of both maintain the right of ownership in the old sense, these had to renounce them both when economic development took a course which could not be practically reconciled with the original principles of democracy and still less with those of liberalism. Democracy with its motto of equality of all citizens before the law and liberalism with its right of man over his own person both shipwrecked on the realities of capitalist of the capitalist economic form. So long as millions of human beings in every country had to sell their labor power to a small minority of owners and sink into the most wretched misery if they could find no buyers, the so-called equality before the law remains merely a pious fraud since the laws are made by those who find themselves in possession of the social wealth. But in the same way, there can also be no talk of a right over one's own person for that right ends when one is compelled to submit to the economic dictation of another if he does not want to starve. Anarchism has in common with liberalism the idea that the happiness and prosperity of the individual must be the standard in all social matters, and in common with the great representatives of liberal thought, it has also the idea of limiting the functions of government to a minimum. Its supporters have followed this thought to its ultimate, lo ultimate logical con consequences and wish to uh, climb climate every institution of political power from the life of society. Um, when Jefferson closed the basic concept of liberalism in the words, that government is best which governs least, then anarchists say with Thoreau, that government is best which governs not at all. Uh, so he goes on to talk about uh, socialism and... Uh, so here, Rocker is saying that, yes, anarchism um, agrees with the idea of personal liberty and self-determination. Uh, 
and takes those ideas to logical conclusion, to their logical conclusion. So beyond where they were in liberalism. Um, and then here, let's get to where he talks about liberal, liberalism's limitations. Du, 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 du. Um, okay, but that was not all. Not only was political socialism in no position to undertake any kind of constructive effort in the direction of socialism, it did not even possess the moral strength to hold on to the achievements of bourgeois democracy and liberalism and surrendered the country without resistance to fascism, which smashed the entire labor movement to bits with one blow. Uh, ba, 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 ba. Go back up here. Da, 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 da. Okay, so let's go down all the way down here to the last mention of the word liberalism. Okay, well, so, okay. So basically, if we go back to one of the first quotes I read, where he talks about how the doctrines of liberalism and democracy were shipwrecked, on the economic realities of capitalism. And he talks about how Rousseau's concept of liberty was a concept of nation statism and then anarchists, if the liberals wanted minimal government, anarchists want no government all at all. What he's saying is that yes, anarchism provides um, uh, some kind of, um, or anarchism, takes for granted the idea of personal self-determination, which liberalism uh, insists on, but its idea of personal self-determination goes beyond liberalism's uh, statist capitalist limits, okay? Uh, so Rocker uh, does not say that anarchism is... Uh, a continuation of liberalism or um, resultant from liberalism. He says that anarchism, uh, like liberalism, uh, insists on personal liberty, on some concept of personal liberty, but takes it much, much farther. Um, and then in the quote that Chomsky himself provided from Bakunin, where he specifically attacking Rousseau's concept of liberty as hollow and meaningless. And then in the next paragraph, Chomsky himself says this concept of liberty from Bakunin actually comes from Rousseau. So, so you know, from, though, from this kind of exploration of what Rocker thought and from Chomsky's own quoting of Bakunin, we see that Chomsky is very, um, very... Uh, uh, much too generous toward the liberal tradition and toward making some kind of connection between it, it and anarchism. And now the reason that this is a problem for me and the reason that I went to great lengths to show that, that it was incorrect, um, is because uh, Chomsky is... Chomsky does this a lot. He says that, you know, anarchism is the inheritance of classical liberalism. And that obscures <coughs> the reality. Um, liberalism, again, was nothing more than a proposal for how to organize capitalist society. That's actually what Rocker is getting at when he talks about um, the uh, the uh, Rousseau's uh, uh, concept of liberty as um, uh, a direction for the national state, because uh, the national state is a structure of capitalism. So it's not, uh, you know, it's not this nebulous insistence on liberty as a political concept. Liberalism is a is a program for managing capitalism that became dominant in the 19th century. And anarchism uh, was formed part of liberalism's opposition, 
radicalism, socialism, um, the uh, the traditions and the political program of um, overthrowing the capitalist world system and replacing it with something different. Um, and so when Chomsky insists that anarchism is just liberalism, um, he obscures that. Um, and uh, then there's this concept I do want to mention briefly that he has of libertarian socialism as an industrial society controlled by the producers, uh, the free producers. Now, um, I have a problem with this because um, uh, industrial, uh, the industry and industrialization are properties of capitalism. They're uh, mechanisms of capitalist production processes. Um, so they're not, they're not just, you know, you don't just have industry throughout every period of human society, every kind of human society, every kind of social system. Industry is something that you get from uh, capitalist processes, specifically the endless accumulation of capital. Um, so characterizing uh, libertarian socialism as the producers controlling industrial society, that's actually kind of um, conceding to some of the worst aspects of 19th century Marxism, which kind of assumed that uh, indus the, the centralized industry that capitalism produced was some kind of uh, progressive development and that socialism was just the workers taking control of that industry. Uh, you know, the workers taking control of that industry, as actually anarchist communists insisted, uh, would essentially be nothing more than uh, worker management of capitalist processes. If you're going to, uh, you know, capitalism is a mode of production. If you're going to replace capitalism with a society of free producers, then you have to get rid of the productive system uh, that capitalism is based on. So that's uh, those are my two big contentions with uh, with this with this essay. But uh, yeah, Ben, do you have anything more to say? Um, yeah, like we're nearing off like the one hour mark, so I don't want to. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I suppose. Uh, drag the conversation on too much farther because I feel like we've mostly hit up on like all of like I mean you pretty much stated like a lot of problems I had with it and like um we've already gone through you know a complete summary of the chapter there was one section that I also had some thoughts on um like I mean pretty much as always every time I read something from Chomsky I'm just left with the impression of like wondering where he actually wants to say he stands, you know? Because this whole chapter, like you said, has this ongoing this ongoing thing where, like, he'll say something here, and then he'll kind of go there, you know? Like, he'll say, you know, um, what do you call it? Like, you know, he'll quote someone like, you know, like you were showing with Rocker or Bakunin, who are basically rejecting the like kind of limited scope of like uh, like a liberal uh, form of like uh, what they'd see as like, you know, liberty or like self-realization. Um, and then like, he'll also be like, you know, well, I don't know the answers. And then as we've known from some of the other things Chomsky thinks in regards, like later on, I'm pretty sure he also gets into a chapter where, um, Actually, maybe he doesn't. But just in general, as we've seen out of Chomsky recently, being a mostly caught up in like concerns like lesser evil voting, like right, it really just feels I don't know, like it's just odd. Like I sometimes I just wonder why he want or why he is so identified with anarchism aside from the fact that 
he is kind of a commentator on that. And I think it's just an important thing to keep in mind is that whatever Chomsky says for the most part, what he does throughout this book and what he typically does is just be a commentator and an academic looking from kind of the outside in on these movements. Right. One other slight note I had was there's a section, um, and it's a pretty small thing, but I just felt like bringing it up. One might, however, argue rather differently that at every stage of history, our concerns must be to dismantle those forms of authority and oppression that survive from an era where they might have been justified in terms of the need for security or survival or economic development, but that now contribute rather than alleviate material and cultural deficit. Um, so that's a, an interesting thing in his thinking where he just gets into like what's justified and what's not justified in terms of, I suppose, hierarchy or formal political authority, at least from my conception generally, um, on how history has progressed. I don't know. Maybe he could elaborate on that a bit more, but at least from my viewpoints, like, I don't know, like a lot of these things, these uh, like, repressive institutions we're still dealing with today were never really justified. They've all come here through like, you know, a very violent history of like, you know, disenfranchisement. If we're talking about the state or if we're talking about like the early state under feudalism, like perhaps that might not be what, I don't know. Like that's just something I didn't uh, really well, okay. So, can you read the can you read the specific part of the quote that you're hang that uh, you have an issue with again for me? I mean, it's just the this idea here where he says that um, it's just this general idea here that like there were like um, there are stages where certain forms of authority and oppression have survived from eras where they were justified needs of security or survival. And I would just wonder, well, when were they? Yeah, ever I don't know why an anarchist, survival? Yeah, I don't know why an anarchist would hold to that like weird Stalinist, like ah, uh, yes, uh, the circumstances uh, justify these draconian measures. Like, yeah, uh, like why an anarchist would hold to that kind of real politics. That was probably like the first big red flag I got when I was reading this, and I forgot to mention it earlier, like or. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, that's that was pretty much the last little bit I felt like bringing up. Um, aside that, from that. Is that from oh, earlier in the notes on anarchism or from a later article? It's from the chapter we just read, I'm pretty sure. It's okay, like, yeah, I think that was in the beginning, right? Yeah, it was in the very beginning. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, I remember thinking that was strange, too. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the next chapter is... Actually, it's like a collection of like notes, I'm pretty sure, on like his ideas of understanding power, um, his experience living on the kibbutz, mm -hmm. uh, articulating visions. I can't remember what that one's about. Adam Smith, real and fake. That one's yeah. going to be interesting. Yeah. Defending the welfare state. So we might be tackling multiple of those at once because... Right. The chapter's kind of broken off into like different kind of assorted uh, interviews. Sure. And that's going to be interesting because I suppose like that's going to be a step away from kind of all of the like, like you said, the quote mining Chomsky was doing here. Right. Yeah. It's just going to be him strictly speaking more for himself and his perception of these things right yeah that makes sense okay i mean is that is that all you have to say further yeah no like i said there wasn't there wasn't too much i had to say in regards to this chapter right okay so uh thank you for watching everyone stay tuned for future episodes um the next uh, chapter that we're going to be doing um, 
is excerpts from Understanding Power, as Ben said. Um, so I guess that's an understanding power is something else, some other thing he wrote. Um, it probably so, is. Yeah. Because the third chapter is, what's it called? Um, man, it's like, the third chapter is like a collection of essays that was actually made into another book. I guess it's another, this is another repackaging of that. Yeah. yeah, part uh, objectivity and liberal scholarship. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, so that's uh, that's what we're gonna come back to next time. Uh, hope everyone uh, enjoyed. And uh, yeah, I'm Piper. This is Ben, and uh, we'll see you next time on the Libertarian Communist Cast.